This video will demonstrate how to make colour maps as part of the QCPA framework. Colour maps are a really convenient way of displaying colours um, that don't require you to average, average the colours taken from a specific measurement. One of the, the really beneficial things about using a camera as opposed to a spectrometer, for example, for measuring colour, is that a digital image will preserve the entire range of gradients and noise present in, in any given natural scene and in any, any, anything that you measure. So a colour map is a really nice non-parametric way of preserving all of the information. Uh, so here, for example, in this colour map where a moth is being compared to its background, the background is being shown in red and the moth in grey. The deeper the colour, the more pixels there are of that colour. And the, the map uh, axes uh, are the different coordinates in colour space. The cross here occurs at the achromatic point, so this is where grey is. Um, and in the, on the x-axis we have the uh, medium wave to long wave in this case, so that's um, the red-green uh, in human vision terms. Um, and on the y-axis we have uh, long wave and medium wave together, so that's yellow uh, compared to, to blue, short wave. So here's the blue-yellow axis versus red-green axis. Um, but it's important to note that this is all in the RNL chromaticity space. Uh, so any given distance in this space uh, will tell you something about uh, how close any two colors are um, and their discrimination threshold. Uh, another thing about the, the, the color maps is that we can plot these, these boundaries. So here there is uh, a boundary perimeter that's one um, delta S, so that's one just noticeable difference uh, between the moth and its background. And you can see there's this clear um, large overlap between the moth and its background, um, so these are likely to be two colours that are not easy to disentangle at all. Uh, the same moth versus background can here be modelled in blue tip vision. So humans are trichromats, so we just have uh, here red green versus blue yellow. But a blue tit, which is tetrachromatic, requires another axis of colour to measure. So again, we have uh, made the, the colour mapping system able to work with tetrachromatic visual systems. So here, again, the x-axis is long wave to medium wave, so um, a blue tit equivalent of red-green, and the y is a blue tit equivalent of blue and yellow. Uh, and then the z-axis is, is part of a stack, so we have a new map created at every point in the z-axis. And if I play this stack as an animation, it will whiz through the different points in the z-axis and you can see how the moth and background uh, are overlapping quite dramatically in x and y uh, but they are actually quite independent in z so if I, if I stop here for example here is the moth and if we increase the z-axis a bit then we've got the background coming in and there's a bit of overlap between the moth and background around here uh, but then the background um, becomes independent of the moth again. So you can see how a trichromat versus a tetrachromat might see the colours of the moth versus its background quite differently. So in this video I will demonstrate how to create these two colour maps. First we need to load a calibrated multispectral image. So I'll load one I've prepared earlier. Here of this Oak Beauty And next I need to convert it into a cone catch image for the QCPA framework. I'll start by converting it into human cone catch values. And again we're going to be using the QCPA framework so I need to create a luminance channel at the end. So here we have the human long wave, medium wave and short wave sensitivities and this is a trichromatic system and the QCPA framework needs a final luminance channel to use. So I'll create one of those with the create luminance channel. Here we go and that's created this fourth luminance channel in the image. The image already has a moth selected and this background selection which is a rectangle where I have subtracted the shape of the moth and a scale bar. So it's ready to put into the QCPA framework. 
Now the only parts of the framework that we need to run initially are the uh, acuity correction and RNL ranked filter. You don't actually need to run the QCPA framework at all to create color maps. You can do it straight from the cone catch image. But the raw cone catch image doesn't account for the acuity of the receiver visual system and its distance from the uh, from from the moth, for example. Um, and so there will be a lot of pixel noise. So you'll end up with very noisy color maps um, that won't uh, accurately reflect how colors will look to a given animal at a given distance. So that's why it's good to run the QCPA framework to create these acuity controlled images. So we just need to apply acuity correction and the RNL ranked filter, but we can turn clustering off, select human Weber fractions and a relevant luminance Weber fraction. I'm going to simulate, I'm going to be comparing humans uh, to blue tits in the next example. So I'll simulate a human uh, viewing as if it were uh, viewing with the same acuity as a blue tit here. So this is roughly uh, the, the, um, the spatial acuity of a blue, blue tit and a relevant viewing distance of half a meter. Uh, in this example, I'll um, show what happens when we measure the whole image first. And this is the RNL ranked filter. Okay, here the whole image has been processed, and we have the moth and background ROIs. So in this example, the moth uh, and its background, they're adjacent to each other, so there'll be interaction between, um, between the moth and its surroundings. There'll be blending of, of the, the colors of pixels between the two. Here, for example, this color is, is bleeding between the moth and its background. So we can just run the, the color map now on this image. What I'll do is go back to the folder where I have the, the multispectral image, and I'll create a folder for human, um, the human cone map models. And now I can go RNL color maps and create color maps from ROIs. And what this will do is look through the, the currently selected image, so this acuity corrected image with edges that have been reconstructed. It will go through and turn each ROI into its own color map. And here I'll choose the, the human uh, Weber fractions. Uh, this resolution, this is the, a color map is a non-parametric uh, histogram, if you like, uh, a, a three or four dimensional histogram. Um, which preserves the, uh, the the color information at each point in the image. And here you can spec specify the resolution of that histogram. You can think of it as being akin to the, uh, the bin width of uh, a, a single dimensional histogram. And I'll choose the folder that I've just created. Okay, so if we go back to this folder, you'll see that two files have been created. These are the color map files created um, for the moth and the background. So next we can use these to create a, uh, a color map. So this additional function here I, I won't demonstrate just now because um, I need to be able to create lots of color maps and combine them. So this function, combine RNL color maps, let's imagine we had uh, photographed 10 different moths. What we could do is uh, combine all of the moth color maps and all of the background color maps into single maps. Uh, it simply uh, combines them together for plotting and comparison later. It's fairly straightforward to use, uh, but I don't have that at the moment. I only have the moth and its background, so I'm ready to plot them. So when plotting, you've got some different options. Um, first, the figure title, so I'll go um, um, human moth. Uh, the scale specifies the scale of the output figure. Um, so you can just leave that as default. The z-axis resolution here shows the um, the delta s uh, in JNDs um, uh, between each slice in a z stack. So this is only relevant if you have a tetrachromatic visual system. It creates a color map 
at different um, stages through the, the ultraviolet uh, channel. There are lots of options here for uh, the color of the output color map. So you can specify that the color should be based on the map location. So here the, the, the colors in the map will um, uh, be related to the colors in the actual image. So if you are measuring something red, um, the, the, the colors in the color map will be fairly red. Um, you can also lock colors between slices, so that's relevant with a tetrachromatic system. Um, or you can just use a color palette. And this is the most simple, and in this case, uh, every everything that's measured will be given a nice distinct color of its own, um, which will probably be easiest to understand. Uh, you can also specify whether or not colors within maps should be uh, combined. So for example, if uh, one of your color maps is an area uh, that contains both red and green, uh, if it's averaged, then it would be averaged to a f sort of brown color, and that's what will happen if it's unified. If it's not unified, it will show the red um, as red pixels and the green as green pixels all within one color map. Uh, here you can specify the boundary threshold. So this is a proportion of um, of the color map which below which is ignored. So this is a way of getting rid of very rare colors within your within your measurement. It ignores rare colors below a certain threshold. You can specify a perimeter size around each color map. Uh, this is the, the delta S in J and D's. Uh, so this will draw a boundary around this threshold uh, within one J and D so that you can see when any two maps uh, overlap with each other. Uh, and the following settings are just for specifying the um, different aspects of the, the the figure itself. So you can change the, the font size and the, the spacing that goes on. Uh, you can specify whether to add labels to the maps and the label font size too. Okay. Now we just specify the folder where we save those images. Yeah, okay. So here we go. Here's the, the human uh, moth versus background. And you'll see that the um, if we zoom into the map, there's huge overlap. The moth and its background have uh, they occupy a very small space uh, in in the in the color map, um, and they overlap quite dramatically. So this output measurement here shows us how much they overlap. So this is simply a non-parametric measurement of the degree of overlap between uh, any. Uh, any maps that we have included in the color map making process. So if we had three or four, there'd be uh, every every color versus every other color specifying how much overlap there is. So between the moth and its background to human color vision, um, about a, a third of the colors are effectively identical between the moth and its background. So there's a huge overlap there, and it's quite unlikely based on color that a human would be able to distinguish the moth from its background. In this example, I treated the moth and background uh, together in the same image. They were both processed without being independent of one another. Next, I'll show how we can do this with complete background independence. So I'll just close down these files. Uh, these ROIs have been rescaled, so I'll need to reload the ROIs. And I can do that by simply reopening this zip file that's saved with the multispectral image. This reopens uh, the ROIs, and here we go, I've got the moth and its background again. So now I'll rerun the QCPA framework, all the same settings, but this time I'll just do the moth on its own. Okay. So here the moth has been processed, and now I can just save that color map. So I'll, to make life easy, I'll go here and delete these two color maps that I've previously created. So they were the non-independent color maps. And I will create a new color map from this uh, independently uh, processed moth. So create RNL color map from ROI. And again, choose human Okay, so that's created the color map. 
and now I can close this down close close this has changed the size of the ROI so I'll uh, reload the ROI from this zip file and here again we have the moth and its background now I'll rerun the QCPA okay and this time I'll run it on the background only okay and here we have the background only and again I'll create a color map from this file using the human Weber fractions and the same resolution and put it in the same folder okay and so now if we go back to this folder again we have these two two map files and I'll close these down and now we can create uh, a color map I'll use all of the same settings as before specify where they are and here we go and we have a very similar number but with uh, independent measuring against its background we have a, a slightly smaller difference in overlap between the moth and its background as you would expect uh, but from the color map again you can see that the moth and its background there there is huge overlap between um, the colors of the two okay so that's the human color map now I'll give an example of uh, the same done with blue tip uh, spectral sensitivities to show how these colors might look to a non-human. So I'll just close down this human cone catch image and here is the um, the original uh, multispectral image, the calibrated multispectral image. I'll create a new folder here for blue tits, so for the blue tit cone mapping models uh, the background ROI has been has been modified so I'll reopen the ROIs here we go the moth and background are working again I'll convert to cone catch of blue tit here and remove negative values okay so here we have uh, the blue tit uh, uh, cone catch value so here we have long wave medium wave short wave uh, ultraviolet and double so the blue tit um, cone mapping model already has its luminance channel added at the end of the stack so we don't need to create another luminance channel so here's a this is the tetrachromatic blue tit visual system uh, now again let's control for um, viewing distance so we'll run the QCPA framework to apply um, the, the Gaussian acuity correction and RNL ranked filter and we'll use blue tit Weber fractions and now these numbers will make sense because we are doing this for a blue tit visual system with an acuity of around 6 um, it's not known exactly what the, the maximum spatial acuity of a, uh, of a blue tit will be but um, 6 makes sense when looking at similar species and we'll model a viewing distance of half a meter, the same as the human. And uh, again, I'll do background independence here. So I'll do the moth to start with, and then I'll do its background. There we go. Now I will create a, a map from this one. So create RNL color map, and I'll select blue tit. and put them in this blue tip folder. Okay, and next I will close that down. This moth ROI has been made small, so I need to delete that and reopen the ROIs so that I can repeat the process for this background region. That's working nicely, so I will 
rerun the QCPA framework. All the same settings here. Now I'll select background for the ROI, leaving all these settings the same. There we go. So here is the RNL ranked filter output. Now I can create a color map from this background. Put them in the same blue tip folder. And now if we go here and look in this blue tick folder, we have both of our color maps here. So I'll close down this image. And now we can create the color map for blue tip vision. I'll leave the scale the same as for human. I'll have a z-axis resolution of 1 JND and use all of the default settings for everything else. Now I'll select the folder which contains the blue tip um, maps. So now you'll see very different values. Uh, so now when we look at the moth versus background color, there's an incredibly small level of overlap between the background and the moth. Uh, something like 1.4% um, of the colors of the moth and background are the same. So once you introduce the, the ultraviolet component, it appears that the, uh, the moth is a very poor match to its background in ultraviolet. We can go to the color map here. And here we have the same X and Y axis in RNL chromaticity space. Uh, here there is only one pixel being shown, so it's making a square box uh, around that. And this is a stack of, of images, so we can go through uh, the, different, um, uh, the different ultraviolet levels in this stack to see uh, how much overlap there is at different um, slices uh, in the RNL color space. So here, for example, we see the uh, ultraviolet, uh, ultraviolet um, component uh, of the color space is at minus 11, and there is no um, interaction between the moth and background. And with the next slice, we'll see that the background is just starting, uh, just starting to be a similar color to the moth. And here we're getting a little bit of overlap between the background and moth. And here they do overlap, um, and then we reach a point where the, the background and moth are quite different, they're quite distinct colors. So we can compare the human to the moth and we can see that there is a huge difference uh, between the degree of overlap um, between this trichromatic and tetrachromatic visual system. It's, it's very difficult to um, to visualize three-dimensional data um, in, in two dimensions. Uh, so it is possible to create a three-dimensional output, but for publication, uh, it's not normally possible to easily present three-dimensional data. So you can either, for example, show this uh, image stack as maybe an animation, throwing, showing it through the different slices. And that's easy to do in ImageJ, where you can uh, save as uh, uh, an AVI animation, for example. Alternatively, we can make a montage of the image. So we can go, uh, first we'd need to flatten the image. Um, so we need to um, flatten the overlay, which is used to plot the, uh, the axes. So yes, we'll flatten it, okay. And then we'll go image stack, make montage. Uh, and here we might want to leave the scaling at one so it doesn't rescale it. Um, and we can specify how many columns and rows we'd like. So this creates a, a large, large image where every different uh, level in the, the, the Z axis is shown independently. And we can see uh, how everything is changing as the axis moves. If you wanted to um, present your data more easily, you could specify a different level of uh, difference between uh, each um, Z slice. So for example, in the dialog, we can specify a different number 
I'll just do that here. Let's make a new one. So Bluetooth and I'll have a value here of 2, so a z-axis resolution of 2 JNDs. So it will show far fewer um, different slices through the z-axis. So here we go, now there's many fewer slices. I can go image, uh, overlay, flatten, and then image stack make montage and there are nine slices so three by three would look nice let's not rescale okay here we go and here we have a nice nice figure showing the degree of overlap which gives you the idea that um, although the moth and background have quite similar colors they actually uh, differ quite dramatically in ultraviolet component